All right, guys. Audiovisual tells us we can get going, so I'll uh, smack that. I, apparently, I've been underutilizing that gavel, so there's not enough, not enough dents in it. I've been told. Um, welcome to the Utah Wildlife Board meeting, June sixth, here at the DNR Auditorium. We appreciate everybody who's attending here, and those that are listening. Um, over the, the media. We appreciate the audiovisual guys that, that make that possible. Thank you very much for everything that you do. Um, let's do some introductions. Let's start over here to my left with Steve. Yes, my name is Steve Dalton. I'm from the uh, Pacific. Good to be here. Hi, I'm Evan Albrecht, representing Southeast Region. Um, I live in Farron. Byron Bateman, I represent the Northern Region, and I live in the South Weber. I'm Kirk Woodward. I'm in the northeastern region and from Vernal. Uh, Mike Fox. I'm the director for the Division of Wildlife Resources. Donnie Hunter, Cedar City, southern region. Carl Hurst, <laughs> central region. I live in Orem. Stacy, why don't we hear from you and two over there? We don't hear from you enough. Do you have a microphone? No. You took away the microphone, didn't you? Just for that. <laughs> That's Stacy and two. They run the show, make sure that we do this right. If we do something wrong, they fix it. Um, and tell us never to do that again. Make sure that we remember that. Yeah, that's, that's, that, hey, will you guys fix that and give them a microphone next time? Mike, do you have? Yeah, um, I'm, I'll beg the uh, board to uh, take leave of the agenda really quick and... Um, is that okay, Stacy? Is that all right if we do this really quick? No, you don't. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to introduce my new boss, uh, Brian Steed, who's in the audience here, and uh, offer up the mic to him if he'd like to take a moment, or just everybody get to know Brian. He's a great guy. I think uh, we're going to have a great working relationship, and welcome to our board. I, I'm not scared of you. Come up to the microphone and tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you're going to do for us. So I'm Brian Steed. Great to see you. And uh, mostly, I just wanted to say thanks for your, for your willingness to serve. Uh, I hear great things about the board. I look forward to getting to know you individually, about where I'm from, who I am. Well, you got my name. Uh, I grew up in Logan, Utah. I've lived all over the state. Uh, lived in Orem. Uh, lived in Salt Lake for a time as well. Lived in Cedar City. Uh, and have uh, been in each of the areas where you represent a lot. Uh, I think that we have the greatest state and the greatest wildlife resources in the country, which is why I'm happy to get back here. For the last six and a half years, I've been uh, living in, in Washington, D.C., uh, and I've told my, my kids that I did them a great disservice by uh, raising uh, them for, many of their, for much of their lives outside of, of Utah. But we're happy to be getting back here uh, and so excited to get to enjoy the wildlife resources that the state offers. So I uh, just wanted to say, again, thanks for your service. Um, and I look forward to, to a long and productive working relationship with you all. And if I can be helpful in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out. I have some pretty big shoes to fill in my predecessor. Uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, meeting the challenge and looking forward to, to trying to do as best a job as I can. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is that it? Yep. OK. Um, Bryce. <laughs> Bryce has changed again over there. Why don't we introduce the, the RAC representatives today? So, uh, Justin Doling, I'm... Push your button, Justin. There you go. Justin Doling, I'm sitting in for Bryce Thurgood, our, our chair. Randy Durth, Northeastern Region. Chris Marble, Central Region. Chris Shadeen, Southeastern Region. Kevin Bunnell, I'm the Southern Region Supervisor and sitting in for Dave. Thank you. Okay. Um, any anything else that we need to do before we approve this agenda? You guys looked over the agenda, and if you have, I'll entertain a motion. Eve makes a motion to approve the agenda. Ani seconds it. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, have you guys looked at the minutes of our last meeting? Those were not easy minutes to read. Um, but did you, did you carefully look over the motions as, as spe specifically? And 
Are you comfortable with the minutes? I think with the discussion that we had after it, it all made sense, and so I'd make a motion. Okay. So I have a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Any second? You seconds it. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Byron, what if we, I didn't talk to you today about old business and action log. Do we have anything pressing? I, I, there's a couple of things that were, were listed, but nothing specific for this time frame. Just Jace to give us an update on the MOU on our oh, that's sheet every and stuff meeting, like yeah. that. Just I discussed everything with Stacy prior to, so that's the only thing we have today on the action log. <laughs> Yeah, so as an update, um, the MOU, this is talking about the MOU that we want to have with the BLM, the Forest Service Department of Ag, and the Governor's Office um, dealing with our Bighorn Sheep Statewide Management Plan. So uh, we have a great update. Um, we have now uh, gotten signatures and uh, everything is finalized with the Forest Service. Um, and so what we're going to end up doing is having two different MOUs one that has the Forest Service, Department of Ag, Governor's Office, and DWR, and another one that has BLM and those other state partners. Um, so there ended up being two avenues, and the reason for that is the BLM um, wanted to do a little bit different route, um, working with our overarching MOU that we have with them. But the Forest Service one is done and signed. Uh, we're really grateful for all those that put the work into making that happen. Um, and then the BLM one is moving forward. Um, no major hiccups so far, just not quite signed yet. So things are going well so far. Any questions? Will you have that done by our next board meeting? I can't guarantee it, but I, I am optimistic. That, um, I, hope, I hope that we will. Thank you. That's good news. Yeah, no, it's great. So we have two, two MOUs, but the, basically the, the nuts and bolts are the same. Yep, yep, very similar. Yep. Hey, how about just an update? Sure, for yeah. Zion Sheep. Yeah, Zion Sheep are actually looking really good. Um, so if you remember last July, we had a respiratory disease outbreak um, in the Zion bighorn herd. We started seeing symptomatic coughing bighorns down there. And then we did some testing, and for the first time, we did find some bacteria that we uh, are concerned about that we hadn't had in there before. But um, to this point, you know, we've done, we've increased our uh, surveying, our sampling, and we haven't had any bighorn sheep die from um, respiratory disease that we know of. Um, things are looking really good. The lambs have been born um, down there, and we have seen some symptoms even in those lambs, but we don't, uh, we've been watching close. We're working with Utah State University professor up there and a, a graduate student that's down at Zion, and they have not seen any of those lambs die. The ratios still look good. Um, so, so far so good down there on Zion. We still do see some coughing sheep, but to this point it doesn't seem to be, um, seems to be a little bit more benign than some of our other respiratory disease outbreaks. So, looks good. Thank you. Thank you, Jace. All right, Director Falks, would you give us an update? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, this will be different today because I think I might have the longest agenda item. I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover, but, uh, and the, this board meeting should For be. For once, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start off with some, uh, some uh, uh, introductions of uh, new board members, potential new board members. I have it's pending Senate confirmation, which is going to happen this month, right? June 19th. 19th. Uh, but Randy Durth is here. Uh, is uh, on the slate to be confirmed by the Senate. Wade Heaton, Heaton from the southern region and Bre Brett Selman from the northern region. I think Brett just walked in, didn't is he? Brett here? He's hiding behind the TV, but I think he's, he's back over there. there. Yeah. So welcome, Brett, and we're looking forward to working with you on the board. Uh, hopefully, again, I have to, to reiterate Senate confirmation pending, um, but uh, it's great to have those names go forward. So. Thanks, you guys. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is some introductions on some new conservation officers. So if I could have you guys stand up when I read your name, and uh, we'll let everybody get to know who you are. Uh, Greg Baird, who's going to Millard County. Uh, Jeremy Butler, who's going to Beaver County. Uh, Ethan Justinger, who's going to Wasatch Weber. Uh, Devin Shirley, that's a familiar name, who's going to Bullfrog. And Thomas Six, who's going to Canab. So get to know these guys. Uh, Make them feel welcome. Uh, they're great guys, and uh, we're looking forward to getting them out in their, in their regions. Uh, uh, Habitat-wise, um, I can't believe the difference it's been from last year to this year, um, and having a great winter. It, it hurt us 
some with some of our wildlife populations, but the ranges have never looked better. Uh, so we're, we're poised to rebound and, and do well moving into the future. Uh, we're glad for the moisture. Uh, with that being said, our WRI projects are all funded and uh, th those folks who uh, have those contracts been notified and um, we're looking forward to moving, looking uh, forward to moving forward with those, uh, those projects. Uh, it's a good thing. So, oh, one other uh, introduction, Miles Hamburg, are you here? Could you stand up really quick? By me this morning at about 95, so <laughs> he should be here. <laughs> Miles is our, He's our new Northeastern Region uh, supervisor, so welcome Miles to the leadership ranks and we're looking forward to working with him. Uh, some things that are going on, uh, we have uh, in aquatics, um, the aquatic section released 200,000 tiger musky. Now, as m many of you know, we've struggled with that program, getting that up and running, and now we're hitting on all cylinders. and and meeting our quotas, in fact, uh, exceeding our quotas. And we've been able to, I think, provide some fish to other states too. Um, so that's kudos to aquatic staff for, uh, for that. Uh, if you'd like to get in, uh, involved in some wildlife activities, uh, there's some goose banding going on this week. If you like a chance to get on an airboat and get wet and catch some geese, um, just uh, let me know and, and we'll make arrangements. Uh, radio collaring is going on with our uh, neonatal stu studies with uh, fawn deer on the book cliffs and the cache, which provides us with great information on survival, fawn survival. Uh, and I guess the last thing I'll cover is uh, thanks to Kirk, Steve, and Calvin's not here, but thank you all for your service. And I know this is your last board meeting, but uh, I just wanted to publicly thank you for your service and what you've done. I really appreciate it. So that's all I got. Thank you. That wasn't as long as you. Yeah, I rushed through it. Promised. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's move right in. Dax, are you going to enlighten us on where we're going to put wild turkeys? You bet. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Dax Mangus. I'm the Upland Game Program Coordinator, and I'll be presenting the wild turkey uh, transplant sites. Let's see. Here, I gotta be able to reach this better. You're, you're so short, so, such short arms, it <laughs> might be tough. <laughs> All right. Um, this uh, overview of, of what I'll be going through uh, this morning, um, talking about wild turkey population status in the state of Utah, um, some of the tools that we use for managing wild turkeys in Utah, um, talk about trapping and transplant, which is directly related to this recommendation we're making today, and, uh, and also that this recommendation represents a transition from a written list of sites where we would release turkeys to a map-based resource where we actually have polygons, you know, shapes drawn on the map representing the areas where we would be releasing turkeys. And uh, then we can uh, go through some maps and look at those sites. So uh, our turkey population in the state of Utah, and I guess I just want to put this in context. Uh, wild turkeys are really a, a great conservation success story in North America and in Utah. Um, prior to European settlement, wild turkey populations, you know, they were abundant across the US. Um, during European settlement with unregulated hunting, market hunting, habitat loss, a, a combination of factors. At one point in time in, in North America, wild turkey populations were thought to perhaps be as low as 30,000 birds. And, and right now in Utah, we have 25 to 35,000 birds. So we have more birds in Utah than there were in, in all of North America at one time. And right now in North America, wild turkey populations are estimated between six and seven million turkeys. So turkeys are really a great uh, conservation success story in North America and, and here in Utah as well. Um, in our management plan, we, we have some goals that, that I think are, are relevant to, to uh, the, these these efforts to trap and move turkeys. Um, the one the, one of the goals is to maintain and improve wild turkey populations and balance that with habitat or social carrying capacity. Um, another goal is to minimize human turkey conflicts, to improve turkey hunting opportunities, uh, to increase public appreciation of wild turkeys, and to enhance interagency cooperation. So uh, some of the tools that we use for managing wild turkeys 
include a spring hunt. And really the spring hunt is more geared towards a recreational opportunity. The spring hunt, we're harvesting bearded birds, so harvesting males. Um, it doesn't really have population level impact. It's more of a, of a recreational opportunity for folks who want to get out and enjoy, enjoy the spring and, and, and hunt turkeys. Um, our fall hunts are, are geared a lot more towards population management and, uh, and reducing numbers of turkeys in certain specific areas. Um, in the fall, the, the turkey hunts are for any turkey versus bearded birds only in the spring. Um, the fall hunts are, if you look at the hunt boundaries, the spring hunts are region-wide uh, or statewide even for the general season. Um, but in the fall hunts, the boundaries are, are quite specific. Uh, they're usually targeted to private lands and areas where we perhaps have some conflicts where we have uh, too many turkeys concentrated in, in areas where they're causing damage or, or becoming a nuisance. Um, in the fall season, we have long, long seasons and more weapon flexibility to allow for, for increased harvest. So, um, but as much as uh, in the Division of Wildlife, we, we try to use hunting as a wildlife management tool whenever possible. It's our preferred option, but there are situations where, where it doesn't work. Um, uh, where, you know, if you're in town or, you know, on the golf course somewhere, hunting just isn't a great fit. There are some safety and legal considerations there. So we use trap and transplant in those, in those types of circumstances, in those situations. And uh, we, we focus our trapping on these problem areas. We're not going out to your favorite canyon on public land and trapping a bunch of turkeys and moving them to somewhere else. We're, we're trapping turkeys in places where, they're, where we're having conflicts and where, where we have uh, an overabundance of birds. And then these transplanted birds, once we trap them and move them, they can be uh, used to augment an existing wild turkey population or to start a new wild turkey population in areas that have suitable habitat. So this is a picture of our, our box trap, which is I think our most common uh, trapping setup that our, that our technicians and biologists use most often. Uh, the winter is the best time to trap. Usually the birds are more concentrated and also food is more scarce, so they respond really well to the bait. Uh, we'll bait with corn. Uh, you can see it's just kind of a wire panels that are, that are wire, wired together with what's effectively a one-way door where the birds can come in to eat the bait and can't really get back out. And then you can see in this picture, our technician has uh, what is, it's pretty much a, a miniature shepherd's crook. And uh, he's got a, a broom handle with a small wire hook on the end. And he'll use that and hook those turkeys around the leg and pull them out and throw them in a box. And we'll load them on a trailer and take them to one of these approved release sites to help bolster existing turkey populations or start new ones. So um, over the last 10 years in the state of Utah, we've moved almost 10,000 turkeys. And uh, I don't know that this graph necessarily represents, uh, you know, the ideal situation for us. This represents a lot of man hours, a lot of folks frustrated with piles of turkey droppings on their back porch. And, and so, you know, turkey trapping is, is a good tool and one that, uh, that that we we need to use in some circumstances but we also as an agency are transitioning to uh, expanding fall hunting strategic fall hunting in some of these areas to hopefully address some of these situations with uh, with fall harvest rather than having to spend quite so much time and effort and energy trapping and moving birds uh, it will i think it will always be a component of our wild turkey management in utah but hopefully with uh, maybe some changes to what we do in the fall hunt a little less but <laughs> A lot, lot of birds moved in the last decade. Um, our transplant sites that we're proposing today, um, these are, uh, it's, it's a requirement that we have in state code that we identify the places where we would release wild turkeys. And um, these sites are developed with input from the regional staff from the Division of Wildlife and uh, they, they uh, uh, evaluate the habitat, uh, talk with partners, and, uh, and then once these sites are proposed and approved, they would be valid for the next five years. Uh, again, we're proposing a transition from a written list to uh, actually a, you know, mapped areas, specific areas drawn on a map. And one of the reasons for that transition, I know uh, the northeastern region where I've worked, uh, we, we had listed the Willow Creek drainage. And uh, the Willow Creek drainage is 40 or 50 miles long and in some parts as, as wide as 20 miles wide. And so, uh, it, I think we're a little more um, transparent about where we're actually looking to move birds by identifying specific areas and specific habitats. So the, the map represents a, a, a better tool, I think, for, for communicating where we plan to release birds. And if approved, these transplant sites would be valid from June of 2019 through June of 2024. 
And with that, um, we can, we'll go through, I've got maps that show the areas in all five of the Division of Wildlife's administrative regions. Um, on this map, the, uh, the, uh, the yellow color is currently occupied turkey habitat. The blue color would represent an augmentation where we would be releasing turkeys in an area that already has some wild turkeys. And that bright pink color would be uh, areas where we don't currently have wild turkeys. And so we'd be, you know, there's probably not good connectivity or for whatever reason there aren't wild turkeys there now. And we would be releasing turkeys into those areas. Um, it, it's interesting to know as well, um, most of the birds come from, that we are trapping and transplanting are coming from the northern and central regions. Last year, we moved uh, about 1,000 birds, and uh, probably 800, 800 plus of those came from northern and central regions, so just, just for, for information. So there's the northern region sites. Uh, here's the central region sites. These sites were in the packet and are available on our website, too, and, and if we need to zoom in on an area, and if you have questions, we can do that, and we have representatives here from the regions that can perhaps speak to specific sites if we if we have questions about those. So southern region. Southeastern. And uh, northeastern. And that that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dax. Any question? I have a question. Educate me. Every once in a while in a flock, I'll see a white turkey. Is that a barnyard escapee or is that some sort of uh, mutation that I... It could be either. So we do sometimes have turkeys, domesticated turkeys, that, that are going to be those white birds that will get in and, and get with wild birds. Uh, that does happen occasionally. And also, like you see in any, you know, any wildlife species, occasionally you'll have you know, individuals that have... have I don't, you're the doctor, a genetic mutation or whatever it is that might happen to have, uh, have different coloration. But most likely, I think those are probably escaped domestic birds that went wild. Questions? Um, so this being a five-year approval process, um, say you have a hard winter. Um, on the augmentation, are you okay to go back in and do an augmentation, say if you lost a bunch of birds? Or a follow-up to that question is if, um, say you have a big change in habitat, you have a fire and it provides, is there any way to do that sooner than the five-year process or would you have to wait in during that? Yeah, so um, the, the requirement that we have in code is to provide, uh, you know, a list of areas where we're going to put turkeys. And, and one of the stipulations in code is that it can't be a perpetual list, that it has to have an, an expiration date and be renewed periodically. So, but that's about as specific as it gets. So I think we have the flexibility. If an opportunity arose, we could come in and add that site um, in the future. And then in code, it's not super specific about whether or not it's an augmentation or, a, or starting a new population. So uh, it, we're just directed to identify these areas. So I think we have flexibility there. If we did have a die-off in an area that's approved, we could put birds there. Um, if a new area did come up, we would have to take it through the, through the RDCC and the rack and the boards and, and propose it again. But we could do that. But I think we just chose a five-year five window because it was a relatively, you know, a reasonable amount of time and, and worked, worked pretty well. Uh, I see feeding wildlife a bigger and bigger prob problem. We need to educate our public. Yes. Do a little better job with that. It's getting really out of hand. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it's it's kind of funny. It's funny you bring that up. Oftentimes, when we have these these conflict areas where we do go trap and remove turkeys, um, uh, people's social tolerance, people's tolerance for turkeys uh, varies greatly. And uh, and a lot of times, when we go in and trap and move birds from an area, we have one or two landowners that are frustrated with them and feel like there's too many. And two doors down, there's someone who thinks they're great and they're feeding them. So, you know, uh, it, it, I, I understand people are, are passionate and love wildlife, and especially in the winter, you know, can, can feel moved to want to do something to help the animals, but so often feeding causes a lot more problems than it solves. Questions from the rack chairs? Questions from the audience? 
Now this is a time that you can come up and ask questions to clarify any, any conception or misconception that you might have. You'll have time for um, comments later. If in order to comment on any topic that we'll hear today, you need to fill out a comment card and, and make sure that that's turned in over here to Tu or Stacy. Um, where are the comment cards, Stacy? I don't see the table. Okay, so if you dare move over by the officers, you can get a comment. I like that. Put them right there all the time, okay? <laughs> um, you can get a comment card, fill that in, and then bring it up. You will not be allowed to comment without filling out one of those cards. Um, seeing no questions from the, from the audience, let's go to <coughs> rack chair reports. Would you start over here, and, and uh, we'll move this way, and... Give us a report on your motions and and uh, voting. Yes, Mr. Chairman, in the southern region, we had no public comments or RAC comments, and the there was a motion to pass as presented, which passed unanimously. Nobody cares about turkeys in the southern region? <laughs> Dax just did such a good job that he covered all the questions up front. Southeastern region made a motion to accept the recommendations as presented and it passed unanimously. The central region also passed the recommendations unanimously. Uh, the northeastern region also passed them unanimously as presented. And, and also did the uh, northern region. It was unanimous. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any comment cards. Oh, Dax. It's impressive answer all those questions. Um, let me summarize the motions. It's difficult. This is a, this is a tough one. Teasing. Um, any discussion? Discussion at all? I got my white turkey thing answered, so. You know, I, I did see a, f a flock of turkeys in close to Vernal stop traffic this year in the snow. And uh, I actually saw one, one time where a, a woman left her car and fleed, f fleed? F how do you say that? Fled, fled, <laughs> fled the scene because the turkeys were jumping on her car and it scared her so bad she got out and ran away. <coughs> so, so they do cause, you know, some social interaction problems every now and then. Those turkeys were very bold, apparently didn't like the color of her car. Right, I'm ready to entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to accept. He's having trouble with his microphone, but he makes a motion. Any discussion? There we go. Second? I would second that. Second by Kevin. All right. All in favor? Unanimous. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dax. Thank you. All right. Drew, you're up for the CIP rule, R657-53. If the presentation will open. Here it comes. Good morning. My name is Drew Dittmer. I'm a native aquatic species coordinator, relatively new with the Division of Wildlife. I started in October of last year. And I'm primarily charged with management and conservation and coordinating those activities for reptiles and amphibians in the state. And today I'm going to talk about our collection, importation, and possession of reptiles and amphibians and our rules related to that and this proposal to update those rules. And this proposal was developed in concert with myself, the Attorney General's Office, and a user group of reptile and amphibian enthusiasts. I think the place to start is 
with an introduction of who are the user group members in a, in a broad sense. So these are researchers, these are public land managers, parents and school teachers, elementary up to high school, university professors, hobbyists, and amateur citizen scientists and naturalists. And they came together because they collectively engage in an activity known as herping. And herping is like birding in that you go out on the landscape looking for reptiles and amphibians and you keep track of what you see and where you see it and when you see it. Um, unlike birding, however, another part of this activity is herpticulture. Now, not everybody who engages in herping also engages in herpticulture. But herpticulture is in addition to going out and looking for these things and just keeping records of where you find them in the wild, you may collect some and bring them home to continue those observations in captivity. So the user group formed because currently to engage in this activity, they're required to apply for a certificate of registration. So to collect, possess, import, or breed species that the division categorizes as prohibited, they have to apply for the certificate of registration, or they have to obtain a variance or exception for species that are categorized as prohibited. The group saw these regulations, and we agree that these regulations are above and beyond what they should really have to go through to engage with this activity. And it was unusual for them to get their certificate of registration fast enough to engage in the activity the same year that they would apply for the, for the COR, the certificate of registration. Additionally, the group pointed out to us that we have a long list of prohibited species, and there's thousands of reptile and amphibian species in the world, and it's impossible for us to maintain a comprehensive list that's accurate of what should and should not be prohibited. So we wanted to work with the user group for a categorical way to prohibit species for possession in the state of Utah. So the recommendations that we're putting forward today that we worked with this user group on have several benefits to the Division of Wildlife. Um, primarily, we're gaining a new constituency group. It's admittedly a small group of individuals who engage in herping, um, but it's a very active one, and these are people who go out and look for these organisms in their free time and ga gather valuable information that's valuable to me and valuable to us in the native species section primarily about where these animals are found, when they're active, and we can use that information to make better management and conservation decisions. So we worked with the group to develop harvest reporting, bag limits, and a citizen science element. And I'll report in some slides further down on the citizen science element, um, which will be some harvest, the harvest reporting is tied to the citizen science element. We wanna move to a permit and an education course instead of a COR, or certificate of registration. Uh, the permit will be contingent on somebody passing the education course, and I'll break that down as well in a future slide. Um, we're moving to simpler regulations, which is always a boon for us in the division. So the, the rule right now is 31 pages. The proposed rule is about 17 pages. So we're, we're just having less text to sort through to figure things out. And then we're going to move to allowing the sale of captive-born native reptiles and amphibians. Working with the user group, we've improved our definition of what counts as as wildlife and what counts as something born in captivity. And CORs are not going away. We're still gonna require CORs for native venomous species for personal use. And we're gonna suggest a two year review where we'll come back and review that COR process to make sure it still hasn't been overly burdensome on us at the division and the users. Um, so if somebody wants to own a rattlesnake species that's native to Utah, they will apply for a COR, which will come through the, the, the native species office, and I'll review that and make sure they're compliant with, make sure they're aware of their local regulations and make sure that they uh, are compliant with some basic husbandry standards for those organisms. You'll still need a COR for commercial business, so if you're doing anything that you derive a significant portion of your income from, that re will require a uh, commercial COR. Some scientific collecting and educational use will also require a COR. Non-native venomous species are gonna require variants. So if it's something exotic and venomous that you've heard of, like a cobra, you're gonna have to get a variance from the wildlife board. We're not, that's a prohibited species. And I'll break down prohibited species in a future slide as well. And then finally, I really wanna strongly emphasize, no permit is gonna be required to capture, photograph, and release reptiles and amphibians at the site where you originally found them. So if you are out hiking with your son or daughter or yourself, you see a lizard or frog, you wanna catch that thing and take a picture of it and observe it and admire it and let it go, absolutely allowed, please do do that. 
So the rule that we're proposing today, this is just a table breaking down how our rule will stack up against our, our neighboring states. Um, so there's two broad categories to kind of consider this. One's the commercial end of things and one is the personal. So on the commercial end of things, capturing reptiles and amphibians and selling the wild captured organisms is going to be prohibited. And we will align with Nevada, Arizona, and Colorado on that prohibition. New Mexico, Wyoming, and Idaho allow varying degrees of commercial harvest. As far as I'm aware, at least two of those states are phasing that process out. They just have some older licenses and they're probably going to move closer to uh, prohibiting commercial harvest of reptiles and amphibians. The other end of the spectrum is uh, personal, collecting for personal use, and our regulations are still going to be on the conservative end of this spectrum relative to other states. So we're going to allow personal use collection. We're going to require permits to do so. We are not presently going to establish any seasons, but the harvest reporting that I'll talk about in a minute will help us establish those seasons in an empirical way with data later down the road. We'll have that ability to adapt and establish seasons if we need to. When we're establishing limits in a reporting requirement. And the reporting requirement, which I'll also break down, we're going to be especially unique. We're going to be the only state that I know of, not, not just outside of, not just within our neighbors, but in the nation that is going to have a, a reporting requirement for reptile and amphibian harvest. So the proposed changes for the permits and the education course. The education course is going to be the barrier to entry to purchasing your permit. So the education course will cover basic biology of reptiles and amphibians. It's going to focus on Utah's reptile and amphibian diversity, which is roughly 15 amphibians and 61 reptiles. It's going to cover safety in some depth. We have rattlesnakes, as many of you are aware of, in Utah. And so we want to make sure that users take this education course or are aware of the appropriate ways to interact with rattlesnakes when they're out on the landscape. And also we have a venomous lizard, which is a, a, list, or is a listing entity. And so we want to be aware that one, there's a safety element for interacting with that, but it's also protected. Um, threats from non-native species are going to be covered in some depth. We have a lot of invasive reptile and amphibian issues in the state of Utah. So we want to make sure that this user group is helping us increase awareness of that issue. And tied closely to that issue is that it will be illegal to release reptiles and amphibians that have been in captivity for any length of time. And this is especially important because reptiles that, even if they're native to the state, that are brought into captivity can develop diseases that when you re-release them into the wild, infect our wild populations. And we want to make sure we mitigate that in any way that we can. We'll cover habitat, conservation, and a basic overview of the regulations. And then after that, the permit can be purchased after completing the education course. And again, this will all be available online. So the recommended changes for limits. We've established bag limits for all of our native reptiles and amphibians. And there's going to be three categories for those bag limits. And increasing from the most conservative bag limit to the most liberal bag limit are limited, standard, and expanded. This language is borrowed from our existing regulatory structure on bag limit categories. So the limited bag is for two species per year and four in total possession. We put 14 species of reptiles in this category. We worked with the user group to do this. We put species that are particularly valued by the reptile and amphibian enthusiasts into this category. We still want the data from where these species are. So we wanted to have the reporting requirement tied to these species, but we wanted to maintain some conservative, uh, on the conservative end of the spectrum for the bag limits for these species. The standard bag limit category are for species that aren't as popular for people to capture and take home. Um, but we still wanted to know if people were going out and looking for these things and taking them home and we wanted data from some of these species. Some of the, some of the species in the standard category we just don't have very much locality information for. So in that category there's going to be three species per year, nine in total possession, and that'll apply to 10 species of amphibians and 25 species of reptiles. The expanded category is kind of a unique category. We put four lizard species in this category. These are all lizard species that are very, very common in the state of Utah. There'll be 25 per year per species, 50 in total possession. This category is specifically for people who keep species of snakes that only reliably eat lizards in captivity. So this gives those people an opportunity to harvest food for their pet snake. Um, the proposed changes for the harvest reporting. This is probably the most important change that we're bringing forth. And this is uh, expressly important, again, for us at the Division of Wildlife in the native species section. So we're going to have an online reporting requirement where when you go out and capture your snake, your lizard, 
Um, you're going to be required to record the species, the number taken, the locality of the capture, and you're going to be required to report that within 72 hours of the take. This timestamp is particularly important because it gives us the ability to gauge both when the users are doing this, but also when these animals are actually active. And this is going to pipe a lot of really important and valuable data that will help us move forward with SGCN. Uh, SGCN management efforts and uh, just understanding the locality and distribution of these species in Utah in a better and more detailed way. And again, the people who engage in this do this in their free time. This is, this is free data that we're getting from individuals who go out and look for this stuff, these species. We'll use this online reporting to update a guidebook that's published every three years. So a three-year revision cycle, we'll, we'll, we will look over this harvest reporting and use that to reinform if we need any area closures, species closures, or to establish seasons. Definitely want to emphasize non-controlled species. Species in this category can be collected in any number but may not be released back into the wild and no permit will be required to do so. So this will apply to bullfrogs and non-native turtles, which are almost all aquatic turtles that aren't native to Utah. So things like red-eared sliders and snapping turtles. And we do want to emphasize that it would be our preference that these things are killed immediately upon harvest. That's not a requirement, but definitely also want to emphasize do not re-release any of these organisms back into the wild after you capture one. Proposed changes for prohibited species. So the species classified as prohibited can only be possessed with a variance from the Wildlife Board. So non-native venomous reptiles, you're going to need a variance from the Wildlife Board to own and import anything that isn't native to the, Utah, to the state of Utah and is dangerously venomous. Again, native venomous species, so rattlesnakes, that'll be a COR process that'll get reviewed by me. Um, crocodiles, alligators, caimans, if it looks like an alligator or crocodile, that's prohibited. We're going to have a, a few species of prohibited amphibians. These are amphibians that we have conservation concerns for or conservation agreements for. So relic leopard frog, Arizona toad, Columbia spotted frog, boreal toad, those will all be prohibited for capture and possession. The following native reptiles, Gila monster, Mojave desert tortoise, are going to be prohibited because we have existing threatened and endangered species concerns for those two organisms. And species with conservation concerns can be listed as prohibited or be prohibited by area closure at any time. So via the harvest reporting and being other management information that comes in from our regional biologist, we can close any species on an as-needed basis. Propagation. This one was particularly important to the user group, and I think we're getting a lot of value out of this by defining an endpoint for a captive bred organism. So we were really interested in determining like when does a harvest of an organism actually count as a harvest. So when people take things from the wild, even if they're going to keep it as a pet, it's removing it from the wild population. So we were concerned about that. But if it's born in captivity, it's no longer removal from the wild population. So we established a definition of captive bred and born in captivity. And so people will be able to breed their wild harvested snakes and the offspring of those wild harvested snakes are allowable for sale. So long as that sale does not exceed the cost of just basic husbandry and upkeep of their captive colony. If they're entering into a business model, if they're selling, if they're successfully breeding snakes at a level where they're generating profit, that's a successful, a, a significant part of their income, they're going to need a commercial COR to continue with that activity. We developed a packet that we sent out um, to the Utah Department of Health and the Utah Department of Ag. Um, the packet covered the species that we put in the bag limits, the regulations, and we had a briefing paper that broke down everything into a two-page paper. Um, and we received support from both of these organizations. The Department of Health in particular said they really liked the requirement of an education course to get your permit. So just in closing, we're going to move to permits instead of CORs. We're going to require an online education course. We're going to establish bag and possession limits for reptiles and amphibians. We're going to establish a mandatory reporting requirement for reptile and amphibian harvest or take. And again, I really want to emphasize the value of this to us for making management decisions about these species where we're in some cases data deficient. And we're going to allow the sale of offspring of wild-caught reptiles and amphibians. So Sale of wild caught things is illegal. Sale of captive born things is legal. And then finally, native venomous snakes will require a certificate of registration and non-native venomous reptiles will be prohibited or variants required. So just in closing, just wanted to thank the user group. They showed up to many meetings late at night at the office here. Some of them drove quite a long way to participate in the development of this process and this new reg. 
Attorney General's office was really involved. Again, I'm relatively new and there was an open door policy at the Attorney General's office where I would come and talk to them about this and uh, haven't gotten exhausted with it yet. So thank them. And I just want to thank everybody in the aquatic section for their feedback. And I want to thank just the division in general for me being a new employee and getting their feedback on this regulation. Uh, it's been really valuable as I've developed this presentation and this regulation together. So thank you very much. Thank you, well done. Questions from the board? I guess the only question I had is determining profits for the need for a COR. I mean, how, how are we gonna do that? What costs would they balance the sales? Would it be easier, and maybe it, maybe it complicates it, but easier if you're gonna sell these things, you need a COR rather than whether you're profiting from them? I just don't know how you're gonna balance profit and a COR. Yeah, so right now, there's a really a short list of species that are actually valuable from that entire list of wild species. And those species are still really difficult to breed in captivity. So it would take somebody quite a long time to generate any profit. And this was established for the, the sort of, the polite thing to do in this hobby is to trade some money for the time you've invested to get these things actually breeding in captivity. So the sales are very low level. <laughs> Nobody's making thousands of dollars off this at this point from, from wild caught breeding. That's, that's the, if you're breeding wild caught things, it's difficult to do. And so for now, I think it'll, it'll work just because it's gonna be unlikely that anybody in the immediate future is gonna generate significant profit. Questions from the rack chairs. Questions from the public. On up to this microphone right over here, state your name and ask your question. Hey Drew, I'm Ryan Hoyer. I have a couple questions for you. Um, youth, is there allowance for youth to not have the permit or have a <clears throat> reporting requirement? I'm, I didn't, I, I didn't get to see this till late last night, so I'm gonna have a very cursory review. <clears throat> but I'm just wondering about youth and requirements. Is there anything carved out for? So for the online permit with the education course, they're still gonna to need to report the, the harvest that they've taken. They'll be adhering to the same rules. Now, if they're out just catching things, there's no permit required for that. If they just want to catch something and field, let it field go. Field herping is still just. Field herping is no permit required. Okay. But if they're actually catching it and taking it home, we want that reporting information. It's incredibly valuable, so I really well, don't, well, don't want to. Well, except for those garter snakes in my backyard. My even, even that can be really valuable in some cases. When we start to get into the outer regions oh, yeah. of, of the distribution, that data becomes really important. So that's why I really want to stick to that rule. Uh, I looked on the, the list of species that you have in the back and the take. Um, and I noted milk snake was, was asterisked in the middle of, of the uh, rattlesnakes, middle uh, of venomous. Is that intentional? No, that's in the wrong column. Milk snake should be in the, in the limited category. Well, it's under, it's under limited, two per year, but the West, it says Western milk snake. It has it. Oh, it's an asterisk because of, of subspecies issues, like the actual taxonomy of it. We're, we're just trying to figure out based on the most recent literature, what name we actually want to call it. But so like, is it, is here, it, sure. So you have an asterisk here indicating that it requires a COR, which is inconsistent with, with pyromelanon. And yeah, other so, okay, species. now I know the area you're talking about. This, there's an email that came out of it. It shouldn't have the asterisk. Milk okay. should not have that asterisk. So okay. if that is an error, we'll fix that in the, in the final version. Um, <clears throat> Capture definition was another question as far as, you, you did indicate that, you know, at the point of capture, photograph, and that's fine, you don't, you don't have to, uh, you can release it at that point. When does it become capture? I didn't see that defined. When does it count as captured? Yes. So I believe that we have a distance rule, sort of a loose distance rule. I know it used to be. I didn't see it, but again, it's real cursory. I think it should, it should be in there. It's, it might be buried a little bit, but I, I think off the top of my head, it's a quarter mile from, from the original point of capture. And then uh, transfers during season. Um, you had a limitation. They had to have written authorization with DWR. What's the purpose behind that? 
it's to help cover any like laundering issues for people who might be capturing species for someone else. So like you could technically buy the permit and not capture your snakes. You could receive them from someone else. So we wanted to have that codified so that we would know if somebody was systematically going out to the same site. But if someone's systematically doing that, they're not going to report it. So I mean, what's, the, what's really the purpose We'll see the reporting of people. So to require them to receive the organism in transfer via the permit, they're going to have to report that they've received organisms to be in legal possession. I, I understand all that. It just seems like uh, a solution to, that's onerous without it, without it solving the problem. I did, we have to start somewhere, and I disagree. We, we have to have some reporting requirement for transfers. And so that's what it is, is to tell people you need to report if you're receiving the organism, even if you didn't go out and harvest it yourself. Understood. Okay. That's my questions. Thank you very much. Any additional questions from the audience? Does that include comments? Nope. Comments will come in just a minute. Thank you. Come on up. State your name and ask your question. My name is Trevor Goel. Um, my question is, so if you have people who have bred um, native species, those cannot be released. So if you have somebody that's bred a bunch of species and then they decide, you know, I'm really not into this as much anymore, are there resources available that they can turn it back in or are they required to um, dispose of the... We'll work with them. We have the user group available to us. And so they're born in captivity and so they can sell them if they, if they wanted to. Um, and we have this user group contact. You can contact my office and I'll, I'll work with them to, to help find a, a solution to that problem. Cool. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. Let's start with the Southern and give us a report on your, on your motion. Motions and votes. Um, we had one public comment in favor. We had no rack comments other than some junior high-esque um, comments on the word herping. I've been really, really struggling with that junior high esque. Yeah, that 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 surfaced in our in our. Region. As a medical doctor, that's a tough one. Yeah, to leave alone. <laughs> um, so anyway, to to come back to to what we're here for, the the motion was made to pass as presented, and it passed unanimous to approve as presented. Sorry. I can't top that. Southeastern region passed it unanimously. Perfect. The central region also passed it unanimously. As did the northeastern region. The uh, northern region recommended the Wildlife Board accept collection, importation, and possession rule amendments as presented, and it was 11 4, 1 against. The individual that was against it was not comfortable with um, relaxing the opportunity to keep more venomous, state, venomous reptiles in captivity. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move to the comment period. I have two comment cards, one from Dave, is that Jensen? And Ryan Hoyer. So Dave, if you'll come up to the microphone, um, you'll have three minutes um, to present your, your comment for us. And then following Dave will be Ryan Hoyer. Good morning, Director Fowkes and members of the Wildlife Board, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I have four and a half pages of prepared text. I will not deliver that all. You should be quite grateful for that. Uh, <laughs> we'll go through this as quickly as uh, I possibly can. Uh, my name is Dave Jensen. I'm the owner of Wasatch Snake Removal in Salt Lake City, and my team and I are permitted under a COR to relocate snakes statewide, and we move a lot of rattlesnakes every summer along the Wasatch Front uh, for the protection of snakes and humans alike, and we do it in a according to established protocols. And saving snakes and educating people about them is our main focus, and we thank you for granting us that privilege. Um, number one, I would like to say thank you for hiring a state herpetologist. Uh, Utah needs a state herpetologist, and, and Drew is doing a fantastic job. I wish I had known more about the, uh, the uh, user uh, input. I would have liked to have been part of that process. Um, as a snake relocator, I'm surprised at the number of Utahns who have no idea that all of our native herptofauna is protected by law or that it is completely unethical to kill snakes based on ignorance or fear or to sell them on the internet, which we see every summer with people selling things on KSL, uh, which makes them poachers. Um, these are my concerns about the proposal. 
assuming I understand it correctly. Um, there have been significant declines in population numbers of certain reptiles and amphibian species in specific locales. Uh, several Utah herp species are controlled or are classified as species of special concern, and these are only the ones the state's able to monitor. Uh, reptile populations are difficult to determine because they can experience natural fluctuations, making census counts difficult or inaccurate. Entire ecosystems can be destroyed by fire, while some species have been decimated by the illegal pet trade. Uh, other animals may be prolific, but seldom seen, or they may be in severe decline. We don't always know. Uh, no matter how prolific a species may appear to be, reptile mortality rates are high, mostly due to predation, meaning that most offspring will not survive long enough to reproduce. Uh, this is why strict limits need to be placed on how many adult specimens can be removed from an area each season. Limits should always be based on ensuring the stability of a species first and not based on how many people want to keep them as pets. Uh, I think we should require applicants to demonstrate knowledge, and I'm happy to see there is an educational component to this, uh, to demonstrate proficiency in keeping reptiles and amphibians in captivity. It's not always easy. Some species have extreme needs and are very difficult to maintain. Horned lizards, for example, uh, Dave, eat a I'm, diet of... I'm going to give you some additional time, so... Oh, okay, thank you. I, panic, I, 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 you I, I, oh, okay, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, horned lizards, for example, eat a diet of ants, and for this reason, virtually every horned lizard ever taken home by anyone, including me when I was 10 years old, uh, died of starvation or unintentional neglect. Uh, certain species should be restricted to professional keepers only or prohibited altogether. Uh, rubber boas are another species that fall under this category. Um, breeding permits uh, should be required in a higher fee charged if people are prohibiting, or excuse me, are profiting from the sale of captive propagated native animals. Uh, presently, offspring produced from wild-caught animals can't be released into the wild. What happens to these excess animals? Would they have to be euthanized? Um, require that all captive bred offspring be reported to the DWR and identified using photographs that show patterning since each animal is unique, or perhaps they could be microchipped. Uh, how would the people who purchased these offspring prove they weren't taken from the wild? Uh, current processes don't always work the way they're supposed to. For example, a permit is required to keep a Utah milk snake presently, but virtually no one purchases the permit and then goes looking for a milk snake. Because milk snakes can be relatively hard to find, most people find the snake first, then purchase the permit after the fact if they purchase one at all. Um, in Arizona, citizens can keep up to two specimens of most of the state's 13 native rattlesnakes just by purchasing a license at Walmart, which I was quite shocked to find that out. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Utah takes this approach, but uh, make it feasible for qualified individuals, such as myself, to keep a single venomous snake in a private residence. Um, Several years ago, there was a proposal to allow people to propagate rattlesnakes in a residential setting, uh, and whereas the provision would be similar to the variants of keeping a Gila monster, where only one venomous snake would be allowed with the possible requirement that, like a Gila monster, it be presented at least once a year in an educational setting for the benefit of the general public. Um, and I'm wondering how the state will require recreational field herpers to report location data. If they volunteer to, that's fine, but the word require seems unusual in, in the, uh, you know, the enforceability of that. Um, <clears throat> even well-intentioned people uh, collect native reptiles and amphibians and sell them on the internet, not realizing that these animals belong to all of us and that doing so makes them poachers by definition. Uh, there should be harsh penalties for these people after an initial warning. I recommend the following changes to the proposal if it passes. Um, does this proposal apply to non-Utah residents or only to citizens of Utah? I would recommend restricting participation to Utah residents only, uh, keeping in mind that registration won't stop poaching or the illicit keeping of illegal animals, which is and always has been a problem. Um, to reduce impacts on unknown populations, bag limits should be restricted to two animals from a single locale. Um, I believe that's all I have, and I thank Drew for his input, and I thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Um, Drew, help me with the uh, residency issue. We currently won't have a residency requirement, but that's why we're doing a two-year and three-year review for this process to gauge external interests from other states, and then we'll, we can move into a, a non-resident application requirement and maybe increase that fee. But we definitely want to explore that avenue because that 
gives us another funding opportunity. And we are aware via the user group and even myself that several people travel to Utah specifically for this activity. There's some things that are very, that are easier to observe in Utah than other states. So people travel here to do this. And so I want to make sure that we're recognizing that user group as well as just residents. Okay. All right, Ryan, you're up. Thank you. I've, uh, I've been involved in rewriting the HERP regs since 2001, um, heavily involved in numerous revisions. Although, unfortunately, or fortunately perhaps, um, I was not involved in this one until I found out about it a little bit later. I knew something was afoot. I did not know about it. I see a lot of redlining in here, and a lot of that that was cut out was from that, uh, what is it, 2007, 2008 um, bureaucratic process, and I am so glad to see that cut out. I am glad to see the improvements that, uh, that Drew has made here. I think he's done a great job bringing rational thought to this in uh, educated understanding of herpetology. I, uh, I do out, go out and chase herps. I've been doing it for 45 years, but not herpes, just, just herps. Um, is that okay? Yeah, okay. Doctor gives approval. Good. Um, there's, there's a lot of good, a lot of good things. I think this is great progress. Um, I, I have some reservation, I guess, on some of the, the implementation of, of the details, the reporting, um, and how those will be implemented. But I'm sure, seeing the process and what's written, that, that that's going to be hammered out just fine. Um, I would say that I, except on the rattlesnake issue, I probably disagree with Dave on every other single point. Um, having known rubber boas better than anybody in the state of Utah. Uncategorically, I can say that. Um, my father researches them, has published number of papers. I've been, I've been handling them for 45 years. Um, they can be difficult. My website gives all the information you need. Not that hard to keep. Extremely common. I see more rubber bows than I, I do elk, and I archery elk hunt. I call it elk in. Um, you just have to know. The last, this last week the was rest great. Of you close your ears for that comment. Don't back there. <laughs> the, this, this, this last week was great rubber boa finding time. It's done, it's done. until we get more rain. Done, you know, until we get, if, unless we get a cold, you know, June storm we get every couple of years, or they'll be nocturnal from here on out. But so, there, you know, these are very difficult to find, but very numerically abundant. So I am glad to see the state putting some rational uh, regulations in place to be able to use this resource instead of the way it was before, is hands off completely. Uh, for instance, I am, I'm heading out this afternoon. I've been planning it for a week. I've been heading out this afternoon to look for a range extension, extension on Arizona mountain king snakes. Uh, northernmost latitude, there's some rumors, and uh, I can't apply for a COR at this point. I, I'm not even, I, I don't know that I'm, I don't remember the exact rules. I'm not sure that I was even able to touch it to take the photographs and do the labial cal scale counts to confirm the species, whether it's milk snake or pyromelana. This changes that, and plus then I'd be reporting data, or I have at least a method even if I don't take the animal, I have a method to report exactly where I find it. So I think this is a, a wonderful improvement. Um, I really like it. So I would highly recommend approving this regulation. It's a new rule. Thank you very much. OK, uh, this passed through the rack process with one vote. You have a question? Yeah, Mr. Chair, we got one more comment card, and then just to make sure there was also a letter submitted to the board from the leader of this user group. I want to make sure that all board members were able to receive that and, and review it as well. You mean the letter that was up here? Uh, oh, the one, okay, yeah, all right. All right, Mark, go ahead and give us your comment. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I was less familiar with the process. It's been a while since I've come to Utah Wildlife Board meeting. I was part of the group um, who helped, uh, actually, with Ryan many years ago, who helped uh, adjust this rule um, years ago, back in the 2004 and 2007 revisions. Um, I'm somebody who has always had an interest in um, reptiles and amphibians, and part of it is an interest in um, finding species in the wild in new places. There's a big challenge in that. And for secretive places um, in areas where there are uh, not many paved roads. 
it, it's, it's a fun challenge. Um, but um, as a kid, I was also very interested in tropical fish breeding. And so I also understand captive snake husbandry and breeding fairly well, although it's become much less important to me as I've developed a greater interest in um, simply photo vouchering wild specimens. And there are dozens of specimens at the BYU Museum um, you know, with my name attached to them. And most of those are, are um, well, they're a mix of, of, of scavenged dead on road specimens from interesting species and areas and also um, photo vouchered live specimens with their accompanying details that the um, museum there deemed uh, sufficient to count as um, you know, new important dots on the range maps. So I'm I'm familiar with both uh, um, captive husbandry of uh, mostly non-natives. As part of the old process, I um, applied for uh, permits two years for Utah mountain king snakes and succeeded in collecting one of each sex in adjacent years from the same area. And for whatever reason, they haven't bred for me yet, but they're still alive after nine years and doing just fine. And maybe they'll wake up one morning and, and succeed in that. Anyway, um, so that, that's just a tiny bit about me. I want to mention the user, the user, the stakeholder group that has met with the division, with uh, Greg and Drew and some others from the division. It has been um, made up of a handful of people who are pretty diverse. Um, and uh, I've been uh, glad to be invited to be a part of that. And um, I, I was glad for the chance to understand some of the new faces at the division. Um, Drew and Greg are both new to me um, as of the last year. And um, I find a lot of their uh, views and perspectives to be refreshing and um, an improvement. I'm also somebody who was a part-time um, employee of the division during um, the seasons of 2014 and 15. I worked directly under Chrissy Wilson, the former native aquatics supervisor, um, surveying uh, um, lesser known reptiles in western Utah with funding from uh, the military, actually. And that was uh, something that uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to have been part of. I disagree with um, the, the, the previous comments from Mr. Jensen regarding the majority of people who collect uh, milk snakes and mountain king snakes or whatever, or milk snakes, doing so first and getting the permit later. I guess that may happen. I think a lot of the people who might break the law by collecting without a permit might never bother to get a permit later. Um, and everybody I know who's been interested in that has gotten the permit first. And some people buy the permit, don't succeed in the year. And um, but anyway, the the new system's going to be if it if you approve this this new version of the rule, the new system will be a little bit different. But I, I would disagree with his characterization. Um, I, I'm sure. Uh, somewhat, okay? And then lastly, I'll just mention that I don't think that the, the rule that, that you're considering today is perfect. Um, there are probably some, some things I would have done a little differently. There were suggestions that I suggested that did not get paid attention to. But in general, I think it's good and it's an improvement. And um, what I'm confident for and hope for the most is a continued um, good connection with people like Drew here um, that I think I can see will will be um, will be something that we can count on and feel feel good about and uh, so if there are problems in the future I, I think that as long as the personnel of the division stays similar to what I've known for the, the recent months I think um, any small problems can get overcome okay is that is that okay thank you thank you Greg, you came up to the microphone because you felt it necessary that we understood a letter that was emailed to us. That's not usually your mode. Why, why did you come up and tell us about that? Um, just because the, uh, 
I, I guess we could call him the leader of the, the stakeholder group, the, the main organizer, uh, requested that we forward it to the board. Um, I don't think there's anything unique in that letter that hasn't been reiterated by the comments here today. Just making sure you guys are aware of that and had received it. Thank you. It just concerned me because we get <clears throat> hundreds of letters and you chose to come to the microphone to make sure we'd received that one. I wanted to make sure there wasn't anything that was hiding there. For the record, I just want it to show that I avoided any discussion on junior high-esque <laughs> comments that were laid wide open for us to comment on. Um, okay, so the, the motions from the rack were completely unanimous with one, one opposing vote from the northern region. Um, do we have any uh, discussion here from the from the board before we call for a motion? I, Mr. Chairman, just from listening to what went on and attending the rack, it sounds like we have a you know an education problem. You know, because I'm not aware of what all the rules and regulations are that you know have been talked about and discussed through both public processes and stuff like that. So. Drew, I don't know, going forward, what your uh, plans are for education of the public as a whole in the state, and then also the non-resident issue that was drawn up, that uh, we deal with non-residents in almost every other, you know, species we deal with in this state, and I think that uh, we're missing out if we don't, you know, apply that to the non-resident for herping and whatever. Yeah, to get to the non-resident thing, we will. We just don't have any idea at this point how many there are. So this is just going to give us the, the opportunity to measure that that group and that interest group. And they'll they'll the the non-resident herpers will hear about this rule. They're they're already aware of it um, in some states that it's coming down the pike. So we'll we'll see those applications come in, and then we'll revisit that. And to get to the education component immediately after we get through this process, I will reconvene the user group. And we'll start a process of how do we spread the message. And we're going to bring an outreach to that process and, and start to explore the ideas of like how do we increase the message and increase the awareness that this is, this is available for people to, to purchase and engage with this resource. So it's, it's on the agenda. Good. Thank you. No comments or questions or discussion? Ready to entertain a motion. motion to accept that as presented. I have a motion from Donnie. Second, any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, helpful for me. Uh, I, I have to admit, I probably couldn't tell the difference between a milk snake and a gardener snake. Um, if that's even a correct terminology. Um, and, and we probably should be better educated. So I, I look forward to hearing what those educational opportunities are for, for those of us who are undereducated when it comes to reptiles and amphibians. I mean, Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, I wanted to wait until you voted before I said anything, but I do want to thank Drew and the aquatic section for bringing us forward. Um, just so you know, I've charged our division with looking at ways we can improve and simplify our COR process. It's important to me that we uh, address these customer groups that we have and, and provide them with uh, additional opportunity, make it easier for them. They've done that here. And the other thing is uh, it's important to me and to the division that we have some citizen science going on on these species that we don't know a lot about. And this will help us immensely moving into the future with regard to that. So thanks to the aquatic section and Drew for bringing us forward. Thank you. So, Kevin, you have to release that desert tortoise that you have, and Steve, you have to kill all the bullfrogs in your pond. I, I tried, but it wasn't quick enough to catch it. <laughs> all right. Phil, you are up for agenda item number seven, R657-12, rule amendments for a statute change. Uh, 
All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Phil Graham, one of the licensing coordinators for the division, and I'll be presenting some uh, necessary amendments to uh, 657.12, which is our um, rule that covers accommodations for sportsmen and women with disabilities. Um, the, the specific part that we're going to be talking about is uh, licenses for disabled veterans. Um, in 2019, there was a bill introduced and some statute changes made that extend the discounted fishing license to combination and hunting licenses for disabled veterans. Um, that was passed by the legislature. There was a fee enacted for resident combination and resident hunting for disabled veterans that fall into the same criteria uh, that we use for uh, disabled veterans for the discounted fishing license. Um, so what we're doing is proposing some rule amendments that will make, uh, we, we realized a little bit late that there was a few, th uh, few things in rule that were contrary to the new statute, so that's why I'm here asking for these changes. So starting July 1st, oops, that was quick. Starting July 1st, veterans with a, a service-related disability of 20% or greater will ha be able to purchase now a combination and hunting license um, at a, I believe it's a 20, 25% discount, so it'd be $28.50 for a combination, $25.50 for a hunting license, and we still have the $12 fishing license for disabled veterans. Um, the qualifying veterans will also be able to purchase a multi-year license. Uh, for those of you who were on the board at the time, five years ago we brought the multi-year license changes to you. Uh, we included veterans um, and seniors in, in the multi-year your license. So we have our multi-year rule that allows that, but when we were reviewing this, we found there was one line in the license rule that said disabled veterans can only get a 365 fishing license. So we're changing that as well to allow a 365, or excuse me, a multi-year fishing and multi-year combination hunting license. Thank you. Oh, that really was fast. I'm good. Any questions for Drew? Sorry, Phil. Any rack questions? Questions from the audience? No? Okay. Um, uh, just one quick question, Phil. Is just how many veterans take uh, advantage of this opportunity? And I knew someone was going to ask that. Give me one second. Sorry, service in this room is really lacking. Okay, um, in 2018, we issued uh, 636 disabled veteran licenses, 633 the year before. But again, that's just for disabled fishing. So any disabled veterans that wanted to get a combination license or were going to hunt as well, it was still cheaper for them to buy just a regular combination license instead of a separate fishing and hunting license. So there, I, I, I can speak from experience, there are a lot of veterans that would qualify for a combination license. I would not be surprised to see this number triple over the next year or so. I think that's great that that opportunity is available to them and that we've increased that opportunity now. So It's something we've talked about for a long time but knew that it needed a statute change and we were going to include it in our next round of, of fee changes to, to the legislature but this one was brought to us by a legislator so we were happy to jump on it. Well, thank you for doing that. Okay, we were told back. to do it so it was kind of easy. <laughs> go back to your pricing. Sure. Math is right. It's cheaper to buy the licenses separate than the combination. Is there a if I buy a hundred? Uh, no, it's not. Twenty be thirty-seven dollars. Twelve is thirty-seven fifty. Yeah. Yeah. My math is bad. <laughs> I thought you were an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's an accountant, and she is horrible at math too. <laughs> so always cheats at Monopoly. Just for you know, love at home. Can we strike that one for the records? <laughs> This will be the one that she listens to. Yeah, the one that she's listening to. 
Okay, any additional questions or concerns? Okay, I'm ready to entertain a motion on this one. Oh, it's not that a, hard, guys. Oh, I'd make a motion that we approve. <laughs> Good. All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate that. Greg, you are up for Wildlife Board stipulation. Oh, hey, before that, who's that guy back there without a tie on in a salmon colored shirt? <laughs> Welcome. It, th this is your first together. unofficial meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, well, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Greg Hansen. I'm with the Utah Attorney General's Office, and I have uh, one fishing license suspension appeal to uh, present for your consideration. Um, this matter comes before you uh, on Mr. Herman H. Kell's fishing license privileges. Uh, in the fall of 2018, uh, Mr. Kell and uh, some of his friends went fishing at Big Sand Wash, and the division received an anonymous anonym anonymous report um, that we may want to monitor uh, their fishing activities. Uh, the officer did, and during the course of the investigation found that uh, Mr. Kell and other members of his group were over limit. Uh, Mr. Kell in particular was one rainbow trout over the limit. Um, he was convicted of a class B misdemeanor, wanton destruction, uh, and submitted to uh, the division for an informal administrative hearing to suspend his fishing license privileges. Uh, the hearing officer suspended his privileges for a period of two years, uh, and he timely appealed that hearing officer's decision. Um, in working with Mr. Kell and his legal counsel, we've negotiated a reduction in his uh, suspension period to a term of nine months. Um, the, the division is comfortable with that uh, suspension time period, and so is Mr. Kell, and so we would submit that reduction to you for your consideration. Having never been over the limit, <coughs> ever, how, how big was this particular fish? <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure on the, the particular size of the fish. I have seen pictures. Um, but uh, from the division's perspective, uh, what, what caught their attention on this situation was the, the brazenness of the over limit. Um, just during, during the investigation, it became apparent that this was uh, a very clear intentional violation, and that's what, what brought it to the top. Questions? All right, I'll need a motion to accept the reduction. So moved. So if you think that that's correct. Yes, I don't have anything to compare it with, whether nine months is, is fair and uh, two years is fair. I, I just don't have a basis for that. So the, the division does have a law enforcement officer that's assigned to review all suspension requests and before they bring it to an, uh, a hearing officer to try and standardize um, the time period that we pursue during the, the informal administrative suspension. Um, you know, I will be frank, typically a one fish over limit is not uh, an instance that we would regularly bring for suspension, but uh, the facts of the investigation and um, the, the brazenness um, uh, was what, what caused the division to bring this forward. Um, Rick, uh, Chief, if you have any other uh, in things to add, but um, no, one, one fish over limit is typically not something we bring to suspension, but um, in this per particular circumstance, it was, it was pretty clear that some uh, um, corrective action needed to be taken. And he and his legal counsel are okay within nine months? Uh, he and his legal counsel have both signed uh, the stipulation, and so it will be, um, become effective upon approval from the Wildlife Board and a signature of the order by the chairman. I'll make the motion that we that we accept the the stipulation of a nine month suspension. Can I have a motion. Kent. All in favor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. We have 
some other business to take care of in, in agenda, agenda item nine, and I'm gonna try and draw this out as long as I possibly can. <laughs> I, I believe this is the shortest board meeting on record, isn't it? Yes. Oh, my final board meeting will be the shortest ever. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, um, number one, I think we, it would be appropriate to introduce the new rack chairs. There are a couple of new rack chairs um, that uh, we, we've introduced board members, so we know Randy's gonna be uh, pending Senate approval on the 19th, a, a new board member. So Randy, would you tell us who the new rack chair is for the Northeastern region? <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, his name is, is Brett Prevedel. Been on the rack for uh, I think about three three years or so. Awesome, awesome individual. It's going to be great. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see, does Bryce stay? No, Bryce is out. Yeah, yeah. Bryce's term's over. So uh, Justin Oliver is our new vice chair, and Mike Lauder is our vice chair. Okay, so Justin. Is the chair. Is the chair, okay. Yeah. Okay, and Chris? Brock McMillan is the new rack chair for the central region. Uh, he works, or he uh, does a lot of work down at BYU, BYU wild, wildlife studies, that sort of thing, so very educationally uh, gifted. Great, so we're replacing that entire table. Okay. Tricia, you're still, you're still with us, right? Okay, and Dave's Dave's out, right? Yeah. Yes, in the in the southern region, um, both Dave and Mike Worthen, who was our vice chair, have finished two completed two terms on the rack, and so they are are done. Um, Braden Richmond will be our new rack chair, and Riley Roberts will be our vice chair. And if you'd mind just one more, I'd also like to thank Steve Dalton as he's leaving the board for representing the southern region. Um, Steve rarely, I can't remember a rack meeting that he didn't make it to, um, in addition to, to coming to all the board meetings and appreciate his time and efforts there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, it, I, I wish Calvin was here. Um, Calvin has spent longer on the board than any of us. Um, he took over for an, in, in an interim position for a year or two years, two, two full years. So he has served on the board for eight years. Um, he is, is uh, serving right now. He's out doing uh, his, his community service with uh, feeding a whole bunch of kids on a trek right now. So um, Calvin has, has uh, performed exceptionally well on the, on the board and is a is a huge part of, of the, uh, I believe, the interaction that we have, the positive interaction we have with um, agriculture um, in, in the whole, I guess, movement, if you will, of, of the positive movement that we've had towards uh, working together in, in, our, in our common interests. Um, so I, I appreciate Calvin very, very much. I think he'll be recognized um, in the August uh, meeting, uh, as we as we begin our, our a new a new cycle, so um, this is my final meeting, and so we need to elect a new chairman. Um, I've spoken with some of you, and and I would like to uh, just make a nomination, if that's okay, with the with the board, and I would. I would nominate Byron Bateman as the new chairman. Um, I believe that, that Byron would do a very good job as a, in that role, and uh, he has dedicated a lot of his life to wildlife and, and wild things here in Utah, and I, I think he would, he would fill that role uh, very, very well. So I would nominate Byron. Any discussion? Yeah, look for a second. Okay, have a second for that. 
All in favor of Byron being a, the, new, the new chairman. Byron, you're stuck with that job. Thank you. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think traditionally we've had a vice chair uh, that, that may be uh, a, uh, somebody that has a little bit longer to be on the board after you, um, after you leave. <laughs> Um, so I, I would accept nominations for a vice chair, unless you want me to make one. I'd nominate Kevin as a vice chair. Um, Kevin, would you accept that if I did that? I would. Okay. Any, any discussion there? Okay. Do I have a second? <clears throat> I have a second. All in favor? That was easy. Stacy, you can throw away those papers. In keeping with the shortness of the meeting. Now, I have prepared a long speech. Um, I take most of my text from Aldo Leopold's The Sand County Almanac. So all of you biologists can leave because you've heard it. Um, no, I, I, I just want you to know how much I have appreciated um, an opportunity to, to voice my concerns. And I've said this a lot over the last um, many years in the RAC process and then in a wildlife board setting. Um, I started this selfishly because I was pretty sure that I knew more than you did, um, you division personnel about management of wildlife in Utah. And so I felt like if I could, I could quit talking about it and do something about it, and I would come board and, and, uh, and be on the rack in the northeastern region, and I would teach you all how to manage deer in the state. Um, and it, it didn't take me long to realize how complex that issue is and how tough your jobs really are. I have, I have really come to respect your, your personnel, Mike. Um, I, I think that, that the division does as good a job as can be done with a very difficult task. Um, I think that, that the state, um, having interacted with the states around us in, in various meetings, I, I truly believe that our state does as good a job as anyone and better at managing wildlife. Um, I'm very appreciative from the, for the job that you've done, and I've, I've certainly been taught a lesson in, in my journey uh, at, at how brilliant you really are and, and what a great job you do. So thank you for letting me be part of that. Thank you for letting me uh, voice my opinions, um, even when they're incorrect. Uh, what a neat public process that is, to be able to, to voice our, our opinions. Um, and, and maybe make a little bit of a change here and there. Um, and along the way, uh, really get an education in wildlife management. Uh, I, I just can't say enough how appreciative I am. Every time I'm, I, I go for a drive in the state, every time I camp, every time I spend some time in, in wildlife, and I always say wildlife and wild places because that's what um, uh, Doug Miller used to say in his, uh, in his uh, introduction to his, to his TV show. Um, but I, I am very appreciative of where I live and, and the, the beauty that I get to interact with, and I've been appreciative of being part of this system. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for those kind words, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we adjourn, I have a couple of things for you from the division to express our appreciation for your service and your work and uh, for the education process that you went through. So uh, it, at any rate, we have a uh, board badge in a plaque for you. Uh, it's in a plaque for a reason, so you can't break the glass. And you know, I always, <coughs> I always uh, accuse my nurses of giving me kindergarten scissors when I'm operating. And... Uh, <laughs> And Stacy has told me with no uncertain terms that this is a kindergarten badge, that it really doesn't count, and I don't get to put it on and go enforce my opinions in the, uh, in the, in the wilds of northeastern Utah. So um, thank you. I, I said when I started this whole thing I wanted a badge, but um, 
Stacy waited till I was done, and then she gave me one that's plastic and has um, <laughs> no, no pin on the back. <laughs> I have to glue it to my lapel. Yeah. Thank you. The other thing we do for people who leave service with the, with the division is uh, provide you with print, uh, Todd Bronson print, and so we chose the one sheet. So that's yours as well for your service. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Does that count towards my slam? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Thank you. I, again, I, I consider it a privilege. Thank you for doing what you do, and thank you for providing for me and those of uh, the other me's that are out there that, that love to interact with wildlife in, in our state. And with that, the shortest meeting. Oh, really? Put a card up. <laughs> Is there Come a comment on, card? You gave him? the snake guy additional minutes. <laughs> I've never heard that in my behalf. No, I just wanted to stand and think on uh, on behalf of the conservation groups, you guys going out, Dr. Woodward, Steve, and, and Crandall, Calvin, uh, we really appreciate your time and effort here. Uh, we, uh, You've been a tremendous asset to this board. A great step up in your position over the last chairman careful, we had. Careful, careful. <laughs> no, just on behalf of Sports and Fish and Wildlife, just wanted to thank you guys for the time and effort you put into this. And then one question related to reptiles. I mean, I always thought there was just a caliber restriction on rattlesnakes. <laughs> That's not a question. <laughs> Mr. Chair, before you hit the hammer, uh, just let me clarify. We do plan on awarding the other two board members that are leaving. We're, we had that plan for a later date. You are not going to be able to attend that, so that's why we're doing it here at the board for you. I appreciate that. Uh, I believe that. you're going to be out of country during that one. So I will be out of the country. <laughs> Have fun on that. I plan on that. Yeah. SRO, I ought to do this right, huh? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. Meeting's adjourned.